the whole nutrition, the management ended up affecting many characteristics on the uh, reproductive tract uh, that affect the eggs and the, uh, the hen's ability to um, produce a, um, a fertile egg or, egg or an egg that will actually keep the embryo alive. Welcome, everyone, to the Poultry Podcast Show. I'm Karen Grogan. I'll be your host today. And with me today is Dr. Um, Edgar Oviedo from North Carolina State University. Um, Edgar is in a research and extension position there um, within the Prestige Department of Poultry Science. Um, Edgar, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and um, how you came to NC State? Karen, how are you doing? Um, thank you for inviting me. And, and um, well, I uh, have been in NC State for about 18 years. Um, I, um, I am a veterinarian and um, I graduated in Colombia about 27 years ago, working in a vaccine company that, um, well, uh, uh, after three years of working with technical services and, <clears throat> and a diagnostic center. I work also on the nutrition side, got a master's in Brazil, uh, moved to the state. Well, first, um, I, I was also working in Colombia for, for a, a couple of, uh, a few months in, in, um, in, in this nutrition company. And, and um, after being in the States for, uh, during my PhD, I, I had a position in um, Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas and came to NC State in, a, in 2005. So my, my work here has been mainly in extension with the poultry industry. And I also have um, some teaching now with data analytics and uh, we do applied research. Excellent, excellent. So what's your favorite part of your job? The research, the teaching or the extension piece? Well, um, I enjoyed bo uh, all of them, but of course, uh, the, the most uh, most of my time is really in extension, working with the industry in, in in many different areas. So that is probably what I enjoyed the most, and the reason that I came here to NC State. So we we cover all the cycle of production in the broiler industry, and that allows me to do different things that uh, I enjoy. So that's that's pretty much what keep me busy and happy doing what I, what I normally do. Excellent. Very good. Um, so since you cover sort of a, a spectrum, uh, um, as you termed it, in, in sort of all of aspects of broiler production, um, let's start with, um, and, and nutrition is sort, is sort of your focus. So what, what nutrition topics do you feel are um, really important right now in terms of um, either breeders or pullet management. Um, I know that that's uh, a, an area of focus in your work and applied research and extension. Um, what do you What do you think are big topics for uh, that sector of our industry right now? Yes, well, um, as um, broiler breeders uh, have been selected um, mainly uh, to keep that potential for growth and um, meat production, especially breast meat then they also have that potential to grow in that way. Even that we restrict them, normally they tend to accumulate more um, muscle and, than we expected, and that is quite negative for the reproductive performance. Mm -hmm. And then um, the whole amino acid um, metabolism is very important. And during reading is when we really set the, the metabolism that they will have in, in the rest of their life. So. Um, we have been uh, checking on, on the levels of amino acids uh, early in life and in different phases during the grow out um, to observe how that affects fleshing and, uh, and the mm. fat accumulation. And that has been a topic for a few years, but many people had tested this and they're very uh, broad uh, numbers and sometimes they don't apply what normally you will do it in, in the industry. So we, we, what we try to do is to get closer to the common recommendations, the, the common practices, and use levels to try to estimate optimums instead of just saying high is bad and low also is bad. Right. But at the 
middle point where where actually we need to get in, in the in the practical yeah. terms. So that is what we try to do. Excellent. And, and in terms of those, um, are there specific amino acids that you're studying in in rearing diets? Yeah. With, with breeders, since it's a very long term, uh, then uh, the, the cycle is so long and, and the effects really need to be looked at at the end. We try to see the whole um, balance of the amino acids. But um, um, the, the main ones that we can control, the lysine and the sulfur amino acids, sometimes are the ones that, that we check uh, closely. Uh, so that's that's something that uh, those two are the, the main focus just because it is easier to control. Um, that's, uh, that is one of the limitations of working in, in, in nutrition with uh, broiler breeders. Great. Good point. So I, I know an issue um, that we see commonly and, and especially sort of industry-wide is um, fertility issues in breeders right now and then feathering. Um, and, and does your work in that on the nutrition side for those things, ha- have you looked at those parameters in terms of um, either rearing diets or in breeder diets? Yes. Uh, on, yeah, we uh, definitely those are the, the main points always to check and uh, also hatchability, of course, that because the, the, um, the whole nutrition, the management ended up affecting many characteristics on the um, uh, reproductive track uh, that affect the eggs and the, uh, the hen's ability to um, produce a, um, a fertile layer or egg or an egg that will actually keep the embryo alive. And uh, so we check on characteristics of the eggs that are transformed and how that affects the hatchability. And yes, there are uh, hens that probably have been fed with higher levels of amino acids or all the stream, very low levels, mm-hmm. ended up with a, a slightly lower fertility and, and hatchability. And on the feathering side, we have seen that it's mainly those effects where um, there is too much fleshing Mm-hmm. that uh, the metabolism tend to be probably more demanding for those amino acids. And consequently, if during part of their life they develop too much muscle, then later on probably they will have higher requirements for um, those amino acids and they will direct those to keep the muscle instead of probably renewing those uh, feathers. Mm-hmm. Also, the, yeah, so also the mass, uh, probably the bigger mass, and makes them uh, at some point more um, susceptible to uh, frequent mating as well. Uh, but at the end, then after uh, more mating, what we have observed is that their uh, feathering scores are lower. So they, they ended up to be without the feathers and, and then more susceptible to scratches and, and, and those scratches then it will make them uh, more difficult uh, to uh, maintain the, the fertility. Even the higher um, or bigger um, breast muscle also probably can make a little more difficult the mating. Right. And so that, that ended up to be um, a whole process of, of how they get that e- e- extra fleshing that they shouldn't mm-hmm. have. So, and, and that happens more frequently in the ones that have higher uh, levels of amino acids. Uh, but getting too low really affects the reproductive tract. So that will be also negative for their um, fertility. So hard to find the balance. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's a middle point right there, and, and, and it's, it's about um, getting the, the right amounts on the right timing is what we have found right. that help us, yeah. Um, so, so as you were, you know, I, I think all of your, your research is, is, is supporting a lot of, of what the industry is dealing with. Um, you know, the other hand of that is, you know, a lot of people are looking at everyday feeding of pullets um, and then trying to balance what you're talking about in terms of your research is looking at fleshing and then later performance. Um, how, how does that um, tie into those nutrient requirements? If, if uh, from a, you know, a welfare standpoint, we wanted to get to everyday feeding, how do we support those requirements and not end up with overfleshed hens? Yes. Well, um, definitely that is a, a change for the um, uh, U.S. industry going from 
skip a day uh, programs to everyday feeding. And um, part of our research or my research is done uh, here in the U.S. and another other part is done overseas. I also have collaborators and even companies where we are testing different things. And um, in, in other places, the everyday feeding is the common thing. They don't mm-hmm. remember right. even the days of a skip a day feeding. So, um, and probably is the differences on, on um, labor availability mm-hmm. and right. things like that. Uh, but in, in fact, the, the uh, levels of the amino acids could be managed relatively the same in that sense. Um, of course, the birds uh, that are in on everyday feeding is more difficult to keep them uniform and more um, frequently um, then uh, sometimes uh, you can have um, birds that will get overweight and overfleshing. But uh, in those places, uh, normally what they also practice, uh, practice a lot is the uh, grading. And the grading helps to um, know what is the amount that to feed. So um, in some way, everyday feeding, is, I believe it should be tied to to that very fine tuning on the amount. So it, it becomes more difficult uh, to do it right if you don't have that chance to do a grading or to be checking weekly or bi-weekly on, on the body weights like other places that had practiced this uh, for many years um, do frequently. So that um, those, those systems work whenever you can do both things at the same time. Uh, so, for our U.S. listeners, could you explain what grading is? I know everyone in, in the rest of the world wearing breeders understands that process, but could you explain for some of our U.S. listeners might not understand what grading is? Yeah, well, they basically is is uh, getting um, the the whole flock pretty much split in the um, size of birds that that different size of birds generally have about three groups. And uh, every time is is weighing the birds, and and there are even machines now, several different designs of machines, where quickly you can pass every single bird and getting the weight of those, and they can be distributed in different rooms, and in that way, you can um, have a more uniform flocks or more uniform groups within the within the house, and and uh, to each group do, you are able to assign um, amounts of feed that will keep them on the right weight. And in general, then the the whole flock will have uh, better uh, uniformity and you can control the the fleshing and all those factors. And that is a big uh, part of them having an excellent performance in in many places. Excellent. Thanks. And and I know some of our, that's a totally um, unusual concept for our U.S. industry. in terms of, you know, weighing is a normal part of pullet rearing, but, but having, you know, almost separate spaces for the different weight groups, that's, um, we're not at that point in terms of our, our pullet rearing and, um, maybe, maybe we will get there. Um, what, um, what would be some, um, you know, sort of key points in terms of, um, pullet rearing, um, that advice that you would give, um, to, um, you know, a company that's either struggling with pullet uniformity, um, or, uh, you know, sort of breeder performance. Yeah. Well, um, one of, uh, one of the main factors in management when, when actually you don't do only, the, you don't have the grading to do this, then is, um, to have, uh, the right, and feeder space according to the number of birds that you have and, and the size. So then how you, you are able to open at certain points during the life uh, the amount of feeders in order that uh, every bird has its space only to eat uh, enough. And the other is if you have a, a chain feeder to distribute or, or, or pans, then to open more um, um, uh, beans of distribution of this feed in the middle. In that way, when there is, it is the time of feeding, then um, the feed will go more uniformly to the different parts of the house and not just 
and weighing that the first part will have longer feeding because generally then you are going to have one area in the house where they were more in contact with the feed, but they have more access and they consequently they, they will eat more and there are areas where the feed takes uh, longer to arrive and, and then some of those birds will and the lower pecking order, then it, it, they won't have enough uh, time to eat. So uh, what I have seen is, is to increase this, those numbers of, of beans that in that way the feed falls all the, uh, more uniformly and synchronized. And then everybody with their own space, every, every pullet will have that, that chance and there is more uniformity in that case. It's a simple management tool and, and makes the, the feeding much easier. And uh, you see big improvements in, in uniformity just uh, watching on those details. Details. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues uses the term inspect what you expect. Everybody expects growers are feeding, you know, and getting everything out correctly, but you need to go look. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's a great um, option is, is adding an extra bin in terms of getting feed, you know, to drop. Uh, through the system at the same time, because feed distribution and speed is a major issue. We have so so many varieties of houses in the U.S. and so many feeding systems. It's it's hard to get it all out there quick enough. Yes. Yes. What, what I talk about is uh, beans inside. So um, that that uh, from the outside it comes directly to some distribution beans inside mm -hmm. of inside. close to the feeder. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so we'll switch gears and talk about your research in broilers. Um, and uh, your your choice, if we talk about your data analytics side of, of looking at the industry um, or recent work that you've done on nutrition and broilers and, and what you're focusing on there. Yes. Well, in, in broilers, um, with the data analytics, what we have been is do, working with, with different companies that have big data sets of um, that accumulated from, from every flock. And, and sometimes they even are able to track um, data from every uh, house. So then uh, um, in many places, uh, sometimes we have some data from from the US, but uh, many times it's only the uh, final data. One is uh, something that is important to have is middle points to know how the broilers grow. And in that case, we have some good data from South America, Central America, and also a few places in Europe where they actually get a good sample, and about 10% of the, the whole flock uh, the, every week. And that gives us a huge amount of data um, per, um, per house. So it's very good sampling in, in, in groups that they get. And there is even the, the, values, the values of variability. So we are able to track how the broilers grow and what is their feed intake per week and um, also at the end how they perform. So that helps us to determine the growth curves and that are the more adequate to have the best feed conversion that are sometimes correlated with less um, leg problems because sometimes they track uh, what are the cold birds and from then they have um, um, a good idea of or, or a good record sometimes of uh, how they are uh, controlling leg issues. Um, so that, that has been kind of uh, one of the, the areas, growth curves, and uh, from also uh, other surveys that we had done, being able to track um, other factors that may affect the live performance. So then uh, so, uh, the records of uh, from which hatchery they are coming from, how, how long is the distance in transportation, um, water values, uh, housing uh, conditions, Many other things, uh, we ended up sometimes with uh, 20, 25 different variables that we are able to um, link uh, using these automatic techniques and machine learning that uh, is basically um, tools like uh, decision trees or um, sometimes we use uh, neural networks and, um, and these help us uh, to uh, identify the main factors that are causing that variability in performance. 
And with that, we have been able to um, uh, work with some companies to improve them and actually um, see that that um, this uh, exploring or, or of data, that this work of exploring data helps them to uh, find solutions that sometimes uh, don't seem so easy to um, grasp when, when you are just uh, looking at, at, at the different values and, and separately when, when you don't you don't look at the whole picture. So then uh, that is the way that we have been uh, using uh, data analytics for, for a few years. And, and uh, in some cases, we, we are ready to uh, publish some papers. Um, with broiler breeders, we have been doing uh, some other things in, in the same way. Uh, tracking the um, um, growth of the breeder and how that affects their uh, hen house egg production at the end or the hatchability at the end. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to make sure that I'm I'm grasping to to maybe how that data would be used. Um, so it would it could help you identify like we have poor performing farms and you're not able to really figure out why you know each time they're at the bottom of the, the settlement sheet. So using um, this type of machine learning or, or analysis of previous data variables, you're then able to nail it down to, you know, one specific variable that you've looked at and help that grower. Exactly. Most of the time uh, is more than one, one uh, factor that, that uh, caused that something is not working right. But uh, at least you get uh, three or five things important that you can uh, go verify and actually uh, determine how they can improve. So then, uh, then uh, that is the, the whole idea. And in your experience, what's, what, like, what are some common examples? In in many places, uh, factors like uh, transportation of the chicks is is, is very critical, and, and depending on how long they take to get to the farm, and um, how long they take actually to place them, because sometimes the placement is not immediately the, uh, done, so that it, that becomes a, a critical factor. Another thing that we have observed is with, with water quality. So there are some parameters in the water that uh, are more critical than anything else because, you know, diets come from the same feed meal. It's the same batches uh, and, and it's available. But uh, water is, is more local, more specific of farms and ended up to be a, a critical point. Uh, even how they storage the water. So if mm -hmm. it is... Um, well water uh, or right. they have some kind of tank or and that tank maybe is is um, on close to the or or is uh, heated due, mm -hmm. during the day so that that changes probably on temperature and, and in some places they have sensors where where we can get that data it uh, shows that that kind of factors so that, that are important in in other countries there are uh, definitely factors related with with heat stress so when when the, there is no enough equipment and then they ended up uh, having heat stress, that definitely reduces the performance at the end very bad. Excellent. Yeah, I think wa water is definitely um, something we all under. I think we underestimate the importance of of good water quality and so many variables that that go into it. So um, that's def your. Um, analysis of, of that data shows what a, a lot of people, you know, understand for many years is that's really very, very important to, to get the gains and things that we want every day. Um, so how, where do you see the future of that, that data analytics work going? What's your next steps? Well, um, then uh, uh, on, on our side, the idea as always is to create a zone um, dashboards where um, the companies can enter the, the data and uh, um, have um, more uh, frequent reporting of the updated data and, and see the trends that are happening and how that, that marks uh, um, an alarm or a system that some things are not going well. So then, then um, you stop waiting for the result. You actually can predict the result uh, by just looking at, for example, how 
um, the birds are performing. In, uh, and, and that is possible to do in, in places where, as I, as I am telling you, they receive data kind of weekly of the performance. You know? So then it, then it becomes a, a more um, that is predictive and, and, and be able to act before uh, things happen. And, and in that way, you can control uh, the final result. If you wait just at the end to um, to see what happened, then it's, it's hard to act on on time, you know. Right, that would be great. Maybe uh, maybe that's not too far off in the future. Yeah, well, with sensors, uh, actually, most of this data, for example, in water consumption uh, that um, people had had them for many years, it's amazing how I mean, it's, the data is there. Uh, right. The sensors are able to do it, and um, nobody look at it. Nobody. Right. We're collecting really lots of data, it. but we don't. <laughs> we don't use it. Then nobody really has yeah. the time or something. So then, more automatic systems to uh, just track things like that will will really help uh, to to do it, and and probably. The, since it's uh, so available in, in, in between farms, actually the farmer is the one that uh, is uh, should be the the one uh, uh, that should detect the uh, potential issue and, and act on time uh, to make sure that uh, the results will be better. Right, will be great. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of the work within, in your lab and, and, um, and your group, um, what are, what are new things that you are exploring? Yes. Well, um, these past year, two years, we have been, been working with, um, factors that, uh, in, in, um, in corn, like in corn processing, corn husbands can affect the, um, energy value. Actually, corn is the number one uh, feed ingredient grain in, in, in all poultry diets in almost all the whole world. Mm -hmm. And at least in, uh, are in, in a big proportion and in the U.S. is is the number one and the biggest part of the feed. But uh, we always treat it as a commodity. And we tend to have only one single value for all type of corn. And in reality, a big part of the performance variability and even some health issues can come from uh, changes that happens in the corn, depending on the variety that is used and um, the um, agronomic conditions that ended up affecting some key parameters of quality that are well known for any any farmer, any agronomist. Like, for example, is, is the bitterness and the kernel harness is 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 a, a characteristic that is measured every time that they are doing selection for the seeds and also when they are uh, marketing in the US um, the corn is is that is reported and there are uh, ways to estimate one of the most common now could be with nears um, and but in general any any person any grower any corn grower has an idea of if it is a soft um, or a or a hard uh, kernel mm -hmm. variety. And sometimes the hard kernel varieties have um, important um, benefits on the agronomic side, and that is what it tends to grow more. Um, then uh, the, the issue becomes bigger when uh, due to the weather changes, then uh, they have to harvest this corn with high moisture. So we did a series of projects trying to evaluate what is the difference, and, and that affects even, for example, the grinding um, characteristics. So, uh, diff so the, let's say you, you receive corn from different sources, even that if you have in the field mill the same type of grinding, the same settings on the, on the milling, uh, you are going to have different particle sizes. And uh, you know, particle size is very important for the fish and, and the um, and the intestinal health of the of birds. Uh, more broilers, but also very important also with the with the breeders and the layers and, and turkeys. So then uh, you are going to end it up with more fines in in some occasions because the the uh, corn uh, trains uh, with the same forces tends to break in in different sizes. And uh, being very fine is relatively negative for the intestinal health. And we also observe uh, something that, that we started doing as a new thing is, is not only the size of the particles, but actually the uh, nutrients in the corn get disgregated. And, and when you have a diet that is uh, in uh, pellets, maybe you put them all together and everything will be there. But you know that then 
uh, pellet tends to dissolve. And, and then uh, if you get these very fines, you are going to have a lot of starch there, but very few protein, very little protein. So there is an imbalance for those birds that uh, are eating those fine uh, particles. So it, 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 not, it doesn't depend only, let's say, on, on being uh, 700 or 800 microns. The problem is, is really the, those fine particles uh, will, will have also different nutrients. And, and it's, uh, it's not just eating uh, what is there, it's, it's just that when they eat, they are eating on a very imbalanced uh, portion of the feed that uh, could end up causing these um, um, health uh, parts. And, and it has been reported, right. but generally all the reports are only based on, on particle size, not on uh, what is in, in those particles, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. the nutrient composition of those particles. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we are doing is with soybeans. Uh, we, we now are able to uh, test uh, full fat soybeans. And then there are some varieties, for example, with high oleic um, content. And, and that is very good for uh, meat quality. Uh, uh, high oleic products in general will have a better shell life. And we were able to see that, that uh, this product is uh, it's, it's possible to use. We determine the digestibility values, the energy values. Uh, we observed that it has a little higher energy value, but uh, we uh, also the um, uh, amino acid digestibility is slightly lower and it's just to balance the diet well. And then the chickens can perform uh, relatively similar to um, the other um, varieties of soybeans. And we also in the soybeans check on factors that are uh, causing variability on trypsin inhibitors that are also a key factor for intestinal health. And uh, so it is the same thing. You get beans that look the same, but when you have and you have the same extrusion process, especially for the orga organic production. So you have the same extrusion process, but then the product is uh, quality is different. And in many times it's due to these um, situations on the agronomic side, on the weather and, and the variety that uh, the higher content that you have in the beans, the, no matter that you have the best conditions in the in the extrusion, uh, you still will may have a higher content of uh, trypsin inhibitors in the in the meal uh, and the final cake of uh, full fat that you are going to receive or, or through the product or so forth. Uh, with the solvent extracted, uh, most of that goes away because a big part is on the uh, when when they get the the uh, um, uh, shell part, so then they are able to to take most of that out. Uh, but for the others, that the ones doing extrusion, it will be more important. Excellent, because your group is staying busy. Yeah, we we keep uh, different areas, and um, I mean uh, we. Uh, my job here, as I told you, was is to help the broiler industry in general. And we get all these opportunities thanks to the support of the industry. And we have uh, several students and visitor scholars uh, more interested on, on all these topics. And also the collaborations with uh, different companies uh, help that they they in some way help with the collection of data and, and many other things because actually every value that they want to collect makes money for them. Right. So we, we, they, they are very, very um, um, efficient and, and, and very accurate on that data collection. And then we have uh, students and other people that, that help me with uh, different data analysis and, and data and, and also sample analysis. We, we have different labs where we collaborate and are able to to complete these things. That's great. Yeah, the, um, I, th I think that's the great part of um, the industry we work in is, you know, you and I are both at, at universities and, and, and we work for our stakeholders, um, but, but they, they, they want to improve, they, they want to gain efficiencies. And so it makes it really um, rewarding to work with them um, and see their industry improve, yeah. And, and, and they also have their own knowledge and, and yes. probably I mean, our job, as you know, is, is just to help them with uh, sometimes the, um, the time that they, they don't have uh, to right. complete some of the things that they have in mind or that they, they uh, would like to do. And, and um, so in that part, it also gives an opportunity for the students to know more uh, the um, place where they are going to work, the, the right. environment where they are going to work. And at the same time, understand the, the factors that, that could make 
um, the companies improve. So that that's a good partnership, and I hope the the uh, poultry industry keeps uh, uh, growing in this kind of um, collaborations. So as you mentor students, we're going to start to wrap things up here. As you mentor students, what's some advice that you give them on you know what what uh, how to enter into our industry? Well, um, the main thing is I try that they go as, as many meetings as possible and they can meet as, as, as many people in the industry as possible. And being in the meetings, I, I bet that every single student, since they come and sometimes as an undergrad, they are able to see how big is our industry and how um, um, they can enjoy and have a, a, a part of, of the, uh, in, in, in uh, a role in, in the industry. And, and uh, visiting farms, visiting uh, hatcheries and, and, and in feed mills and all that also give them a sense of, uh, of the um, uh, sections where, where they can work. So that then uh, the, the life on and, and I mean, the, the actually the hands on and, and the um, that, uh, um, real experience, I think that is what it helps them the most. And later I try to um, teach them skills that will uh, differentiate them on, on, on being useful to uh, provide their um, uh, services to the industry and, and try to show them how they can they can feed in, in different areas where they want to work. So then uh, that is what we try to to um, uh, emphasize on on, on, on a windows of opportunity where, where they can actually feed in, in the future. That's what I, I feel that. And uh, then they, they will feel confident that, that they can offer something and they can go and join a company. Excellent. I have one last question. This will be, be the end. Uh, what is your favorite go-to poultry resource, either a book or website? Like what's your try to true? You need, you need information. Where do you go? Yeah, Karen, we, we have so much information in the in the industry going all around the world that uh, really uh, I, nowadays, I mean, most of, of the information is online. So really, I, I just use Google Scholar and uh, I can find, uh, I always like to see at least three or four references from the same topic um, and, and, and be able to compare and, and discuss and find the differences and what they have, uh, uh, have as, as a result. Uh, even you can find the books. Now all books are uh, online in PDF and many of them are uh, for free and, 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 and then uh, that give you access or at least you can have in Google uh, books or any other of uh, these uh, search engines, you can have a section of the book where actually you can read that specific topic that you are looking for. So um, I use a lot, the, like everybody, I guess, uh, the, the search engines. And, and uh, over there, you can have from encyclopedias to the latest uh, research uh, that is out there. Excellent. Thanks for your time today, Edgar. Um, and uh... Thanks for sharing uh, your work that you're doing with uh, within your extension service and research and and great information on nutrition um, and data analytics. So appreciate your time. 